today. Um, I work in our firm's Employment, Labor, and Benefits Practice Group. So primarily what I do is counsel employers um, through the relationships with their workers, whether that's appropriate to be independent contractor, um, employees, um, help when issues come up with respect to discrimination, policy compliance, employment agreements, proprietary matters agreements. You know, lots of things that companies of all sizes um, deal with are going to encounter on a regular basis when they have a workforce. So in light of that, kind of what I'm going to be talking about today um, is this issue of employees versus independent contractors. So first of all, thanks to our friends at Silicon Prairie for having us have lose the office space or the space today. It's fantastic. It's the first time I've been down here, so it, it looks really great. All right, so today we're going to kind of talk about a couple different buckets of information. Um, first, just some general classifications regarding, or general considerations regarding worker classification, some tests for those classifications. And if any of you have ever dealt with the government on a regular basis, you know nothing is easy. Um, and that's kind of the situation with the independent contractor analysis. Because there's not just, unfortunately, one test that you can point, with, point to and say, if I comply with this, all of my workers are going to be appropriately classified. There's different um, ways to look at the situation depending on what type of law you're looking at. Um, talk about some consequences of misclassification, and then probably what everybody wants to know, um, avoiding the liability or how to appropriately structure a relationship to make sure that you're going to be in compliance. So before we get to kind of the, the nitty gritty of what you guys really want to hear, I've got to give you a little bit of context just so that some of that information will make sense. Um, so first of all, just kind of the impact of worker classification. Definitely um, what the government at least sees is as a significant problem. Um, it's estimated almost 3.5 million workers are misclassified. Um, and, and so what this means is that it's a huge cost issue, and it can be a huge um, boon for companies that are inappropriately classifying their workers in certain industries that may be able to significantly undercut the cost of doing business of their competitors. Um, for instance, one industry that is the abuse in this area is rampant is in the construction industry, where you can have a contractor that classifies all workers as independent contractors and another that classifies workers as, an empo as employees. Well, the one that's treating them as employees has about a 20 to 30 percent excess cost of doing business than the one classifying them as independent contractors. So you can see there's going to be complete competitive disadvantage there for the individual that's trying to classify workers maybe correctly, depending on the situation. So you've got um, a very intense focus um, from government agencies trying to make sure they kind of get a tent around this circus and make sure that companies are in compliance with, the, with respect to the way they classify their workers. So again, some of these advantages of um, classifying workers as independent contractors that, again, are good advantages to take, or good things to take advantage of if you have the appropriate situation um, and issues to kind of be aware of at least if you're, you're trying to kind of ride the line. So you have the taxes for unemployment purposes, uh, workers' compensation coverage, um, employment laws generally don't apply. So what that means is all your anti-discrimination laws, um, benefits laws, none of those laws are going to impact your appropriately classified independent contractor workforce. So another kind of benefit, so to speak, for companies that are classifying workers in this manner. Um, you have the savings on employee benefits, ease of terminating the relationship where there's no big issues as far as you know, how that works, um, if there's going to be charges of discrimination or something that come up after the fact, um, severance, some other things that you might get into with respect to an employer-employee relationship. All right, so as I was mentioning, kind of government oversight and enforcement. Um, we've seen a lot of activity in the last several years with respect to the government and how they're cracking down on companies that are misclassifying workers. And so this goes all the way from the federal government, um, which has ballooned the budgets of Department of Labor, um, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, um, OFCCP, which does the federal contractor um, work, um, the wings of the Department of Labor that do employee benefits work. They've kind of, the government has increased the funding for these groups, which in turn has created more field agents, which are investigating employers to kind of ferret out these issues uh, and make sure they catch kind of what they deem to be the bad actors. Uh, also, IRS uh, random audits and many state laws, and I'll get into some in Nebraska at the end of the presentation, that are kind of designed to kind of, again, capture um, issues that they think are occurring in this market to make sure that companies are treating their workforce correctly. So as I was mentioning at the beginning, there's several different tests for determining how um, individuals should be classified. So let me put all these up here on the board. Um, these are the common tests that courts or agencies are going to rely on to when they're looking at your workforce. And as I mentioned, there's several. So it depends if you're talking about unemployment tax purposes, if you're talking about workers' compensation coverage, if you're talking about 
um, internal revenue tax withholdings. Um, if you're talking about wage and hour laws, unfortunately, it's a variety of tests that kind of hit on each one of those. So if you get audited by the state unemployment, we're going to be looking at one test. If you get audited by the um, state workers' compensation agency, another one. So it really depends on the bucket that we're looking at. Um, there is a kind of a common theme that weaves through all of them, so that's the, the big one that we're going to touch on here. Um, and this common law test, what that means is basically a test has been developed by the courts over you know, decades and centuries of, of legal precedent. So that's kind of what everything is based on. And so we'll kind of just break down some of the factors that are involved in that test, because that'll give you a good flavor of, of what it means or how you determine your appropriate classification for your workers. All right, so the common question, again, in all these is going to be who has control? This is kind of that central theme that weaves throughout everything. And that's going to be the critical issue. So when we talk about control, and I'll touch on some factors here in a moment, but what it basically means is who is controlling the day-to-day -day activities of that worker? Um, if you as the company are saying, I want this worker to be um, on the job site from 5 o'clock you know, in the morning until 1 o'clock in the afternoon, I want the worker to be doing X, Y, and Z duties, I want you to perform the duties in this manner, I want you to maybe have this decal on your truck when you pull up to the job site. Um, those are all factors that evidence control by the company, which lean to the class appropriate classification as an employee as opposed to an independent contractor. Contrast that to a situation where you're maybe, um, you have a separate business, you know, um, maybe you're, you're working in this building here, you've got some office space, um, you're producing a newspaper or you're uh, helping other people out in the industry and you contract with somebody, you're a building owner, you're contracting with somebody to maybe mow the lawn or do some maintenance on the outside of the building. That's, you know, you're not necessarily saying when they have to be there from an hourly basis, you're not saying how they have to mow the, the grass, you're not saying how they have to paint, um, you're basically just engaging them for the provision of those specific services. So that changes the, what, the whole structure of the relationship. And that's a pretty night and day um, analysis. But if you kind of start with that premise and then try to apply these factors and weed it into your business, that's kind of usually the best way that makes the most sense to look at the situation. So on some of these factors, you know, here, and I kind of hit on these in my example. So whether the worker is engaged in a distinct occupation or business, so if you're engaging a worker to basically provide the, or perform the services that you're providing to clients, um, and that worker is directly involved in the provision of those services, more likely going to be an employee. Um, the kind of occupation um, the work has done, how, how much direction or control you have, again, goes to that control issue. The skill required in the particular occupation, if individuals are required to be separately licensed or um, commissioned or, or something along those lines, um, there may be a greater possibility that you get those individuals into an independent contractor situation because they kind of have to do something on their own to start their business, so to speak, and to start working with multiple companies to provide that service that they're, that they're trying to market. Um, one of the other issues is the tools and who provides the, those materials. So going back to our lawnmower example, you know, they're coming up with their equipment to mow the lawn. They've got all that stuff ready and with them. Um, contrast that to an employee situation where maybe you're coming in to have them um, you know, write some code or, or write some sort of uh, uh, article or something for you. They're just coming in and you have all the equipment ready. You have the, the computers ready, you have the materials ready, and then they're just using the materials that you're already providing within the context of your business. So it's kind of different with the independent contractor relationship. Uh, length of time for which they're, they're working with you. Um, again, employee is more of an indefinite relationship where you're going to be working with this individual potentially long term, whereas your independent contractor, maybe you're agreeing with them to mow the lawn for a summer. So once a week they're coming to, to mow the lawn or do X, Y, or Z. Method of payment is also important. Um, again, employees generally, um, your low level or, you know, employees are paid by the hour. Um, so if you have an individual that you're engaging on an hourly basis, more likely, again, you have an employee situation contrasted with independent contractor where you're paying them a set amount of fees, maybe $500 for X service. You're asking them to provide this service, they're going to get 500 bucks. If it takes them 10 hours, they get 500 bucks. If it takes them 50 hours, they're going to get 500 bucks. So that's kind of the distinction there. All right, a few more of these factors and then we'll, we'll move through them. But um, whether or not they're part of the regular business of the employer, again, that goes back to kind of the services that you as a company are providing and what the services that individual is providing for you, um, what the parties believe that they're establishing um, with respect to their relationship. Does the individual think they're an employee? Um, if, if you ask them on the street, you know, who do they work for? Are they basically going to say, I, I work for X company, um, I do, you know, X, Y, or Z? Or are they going to say, I own my own business and I work for several different companies, you know, providing that type of service? So, kind of conceptually, what do the parties think about the relationship? 
All right, so moving past that common law factors, and again, that control element, all those factors, those all weave into all these other tests. So kind of if you got that piece of it understood or you have that kind of in your mind, that's going to help when you're looking at all these other tests, kind of no matter what angle we're looking at the issue from. Um, so the IRS has established, not surprisingly, this, this you know, taking this 20-factor uh, or co common law questions, and they've, you know, made it official. Basically, the IRS, again, doesn't do anything real simple. And, and they try to find ways to make sure that workers are classified appropriately for purposes of federal tax withholding. Um, again, even though they have these, these 20 questions that they're going to ask in any analysis, it all kind of boils down to control. Behavioral control, financial control, response and relationship with the parties. So again, you're looking... You can't emphasize that enough in the control element because that's really the nuts and bolts of it and what it comes down to. And, and again, in almost any test, that's what it's going to come back to. I put this ABC test up there just because this is the one that's used for most uh, unemployment, uh, state unemployment laws. For most purposes, uh, unemployment insurance is state law derived. So when you're trying to classify a worker as an employee versus an independent contractor to determine whether it's appropriate to pay unemployment insurance, which are taxes that have to be remitted to the state government um, based on hours worked for the employee uh, and compensation paid to the employee, when you're determining how, how that works or what's appropriate, um, state law is what's going to drive the, the analysis. And so this ABC test has obviously three parts. Um, and these are the issues that are going to be examined by the State Department of Labor when they're determining if this is appropriate. Um, I'll get into this a little bit more at the end on the consequences, but I'm just kind of making a side here as an example. We uh, represented a client previously that had, um, they, they operate in the construction industry, and so they have this segment of their workforce that's all characterized, they had them at that point characterized independent contractors. And so how this got blew up is one of the workers um, was, was terminated. Um, that was the only per company that they, that they worked for. So that worker wandered into the state unemployment office and filed for unemployment insurance. So the state then sends the, the company a request for information about separation, how long the employee or individual work there, um, what all happened, and the company says, look, they're not, they're not an employee, they're an independent contractor. And the state office says, well, that's not what they're telling us. They, they're telling us they worked for you for the past several months, you're the only company they worked for, um, they thought they were an employee of you, you know, how are we going to handle this? So then the state then audits the employer and basically says, prove to us that they're appropriately classified as independent contractors. So again, I'll get to the situation of how we do that later. Um, but it can be a challenge because you have that one worker that's making that request um, that can really blow up the whole system. You know, this company had 40 people that were classified as independent contractors performing the exact same functions as that one worker. Um, at the end of the day, we, we were able to convince the state that they were all appropriately classified as independent contractors. But were we not able to do that, it wouldn't have just affected that one worker. It would have been all 40 of them, and the company would have had, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in back taxes that would have been paid, payable to the state based on the fact that they mischaracterized or misclassified their workers for how long and, you know, how many of the workers. So it can be a huge issue, and it can be kind of your structure can be blown up, you know, by no fault of your own. Or, I mean, if you, if you think it's correct, it can be, there's real easy ways, unfortunately, for the whole situation to kind of cats out of the bag. And then once one state agency kind of has you in their radar, then you've got state workers comp, you've got IRS, you've got state taxing authorities that can all then look at the situation. So it can, it can really be a mess um, if you don't have some thoughtful processes that go into this, the relationship at the front end. All right, so some of the substantive areas of law um, where this is going to be applicable. And again, this is important because, again, you're looking at different tests for different areas of law. Uh, so unemployment compensation, this is the example I was just talking to you about. Um, so for independent contractors, companies don't pay into the funds for unemployment insurance. So if people are on unemployment, you've probably heard a lot of information in the news when the economy has gone down. Um, the federal government and state governments have extended unemployment benefits now for, I think, almost two years. And so if, an, if a person's engaged as an independent contractor, they're not eligible for those benefits, at least from that company that engaged in this independent contractor. They are for all the individuals that they were employees of. And there's process, you know, to look back of how many employees are going to be liable for that employee. And so it gets really convoluted. But the bottom line is that if you're an employee, you're eligible for those benefits. Independent contractors aren't. And so, again, if you're not really crystal clear on that relationship, um, there can be some significant issues there if the individual thinks they're an employee and they try to file for those types of benefits. And again, this last note here, you know, can typically decide whether all the workers in that position are um, entitled to those types of benefits. And that's where it can get really expensive for a company with multiple workers that may be misclassified. Uh, workers' comp is another kind of hot-button area. And this is, again, if you have a worker that gets injured on the job, 
workers' comp basically says you have to have insurance that covers that injury. Um, it's, a, it's a benefit for the employer from the perspective of if you have a, a worker that's injured on your job, um, this is the exclusive remedy. So the employee can't file for you in civil action as well as workers' comp. I mean, you know, civil action may be you know, additional hundreds of thousands of dollars or even millions of dollars of damages depending on the injury. Um, their only remedy for you is to go through this workers' comp process. And so it's kind of a, it's a benefit and a boon for employers and employees. From the employee's perspective, they don't have to prove all the things they would have to prove in court as far as fault. It's just that they were injured on the job as long as they weren't you know, completely jacking around or doing something they weren't supposed to, they're gonna get compensated through the workers' compensation process. So there's a give and take on both sides of the relationship. So in some instances, it's very positive for an employer to be characterized as an employer and um, be under this workers' compensation structure. Now, if you're on the other side of the equation, you're trying to say these people are appropriately classified as independent contractors, we shouldn't be paying that insurance. You know, that's, that's another um, analysis as well. And you might have uh, industries that are um, very prone to injury. Again, looking at the construction industry, where your worker compensation premiums are gonna be very expensive because it's very common for people to get hurt. And so in those situations, that's why there's a lot of incentive for the company to try to make people independent contractors because it's very cost um, prohibitive to try to, you know, to comply with a lot of these insurance provisions. So that's kind of the give and take on this structure. Um, and just a note on where this might get, you know, I mentioned the unemployment issue and how that can get blown up. Same way here, if you have a worker that gets injured on the job, maybe they're uninsured, maybe they don't have good insurance. Um, you know, somebody's gonna pay for that injury and that's the way that the government is gonna look at this. Um, if, you, if you get into court and that sort of thing, you know, somebody's gonna pay for that and who contracted with that employee or that, that worker. Um, the frustrating thing is that it can go all the way up the chain. So if you're contracting with another company and that company now has workers that they call independent contractors but they should be employees and so the company that you contracted with doesn't have insurance covering them, that worker can look through that company up to you um, to actually get compensation for those injuries. So that's why even when you're contracting with other companies that themselves have workers, it's, a, it's important to make sure that your relationship and contractual agreement with that company is solid so that you don't get saddled with liability for what they're not doing correctly. So there's multiple levels to look at this and it can be a little convoluted, but again, why it's important to make sure you have at least a understanding of what's going on here before you jump into these situations. Um, also, this can get blown up on, from the insurance carriers themselves. Um, insurance carriers will often do audits. At the end of the year, they'll basically have companies submit all their payroll documents um, and audit their account to make sure that they're in compliance. Um, we've seen this come up where companies say, well, I have two employees. Um, we're paying workers' compensation premiums for them. Everything is good. Workers' compensation insurance carrier says, well, yeah, you only have two employees, but you also have these 40 other workers um, that you, you call independent contractors, I think we're calling them employees, and you should have been paying premiums on them. Um, the, from the insurance carrier's perspective, their point is, if one of those people would have got injured, we would have still been liable, and we would have still been having to, to pay that having to pay out on this policy, and you didn't pay us the premiums for that coverage. So now, we're assessing you, you know, basically back premiums to cover those 40 workers that you called independent contractors. So another issue where that can come up, you know, it's not just the state agencies and the government agencies that are looking out for this, it's actually the insurance companies as well that want to make sure that their insureds are uh, structuring their workforce correctly. All right, so other areas of law, just briefly, the discrimination issues, the harassment, um, again, inapplicable to independent contractors, um, employee benefits, um, huge, huge tax consequences if you're over-inclusive or under-inclusive, you know, including independent contractors where you shouldn't or not including them when you should um, on a lot of the benefits issues, you know, probably more detail than any, anyone in this room would, would care to ever explore on that issue. Um, wage and hour laws as well are going to come into play, you know, with the basically minimum wage, overtime, and those sorts of things. If you have workers classified as independent contractors and they should be employees, maybe they're getting paid a set, fa a set rate. Um, and they should have been employees, maybe they're not getting compensated for overtime, maybe not even minimum wage. So there's lots of different ways that you can, again, unfortunately, look at this and get tripped up um, if you have an issue. Um, just a real brief issue or slide here on federal taxes. Um, many of you probably are aware of this scheme, but employees basically are paid you know, W-2 wages. You have the withholdings for FICA, FUTA, your Medicare, which are basically unemployment taxes, your federal um, income tax withholdings. Um, Medicare taxes, obviously, Social Security, all those issues are going to be withheld from their paycheck. 
Independent contractors, on the other hand, paid via 1099, so you're, you're paying the amount. The individual is then responsible for paying their self-employment taxes. They're responsible of taking care of all that on their personal um, income taxes or their business um, returns, depending on how they have the situation set up. So this is why you, all, you often get pushback from the individuals that you're engaging as well. You know, from the company's perspective, it's kind of cost effective to engage people as independent contractors. Well, from the individual's perspective, it can be as well, because you might have people that um, maybe are a little less scrupulous on their tax filings, and you know, they may be getting this money and not, being, not having taxes withheld, and they may not be reporting or appropriately paying in their self-employment taxes. So there might be some um, benefit basically to the workers as well, um, and they may want to, you know, depending on the individual, they want to shirk some of their duties, and so it can be beneficial to them to have them cla themselves classified in this way as well. All right, so those are the federal laws. And I mentioned, you know, some states have been enacting laws that really try to crack down on this issue as well. Uh, Nebraska hasn't been as active in this arena as other states. Um, there are some states that are over the top. You know, uh, California off the top is one state that is, makes it very difficult for uh, companies to classify workers as independent contractors. Um, there are several other states that have gone down that road as well. Um, also, specific industries, you know, I mentioned the construction industry a couple times. That industry is targeted all over the place um, just because the abuse is fairly rampant. In fact, in Nebraska, we have an Employee Classification Act um, that centers on the construction industry and delivery service workers. Um, again, making, putting processes in place and reporting requirements to make sure that companies are appropriately classifying the workers if they're involved in those industries. So that can be a big issue there as well. Um, this new hire reporting act, this is actually a recent change in Nebraska law where this is going to require, um, it's a report that has to be done and it's relatively simple, but you just report an individual that's coming to work for the company um, with the state authorities, applies for both employees and independent contractors. The issue here isn't really driving to a classification issue. Um, this is actually more so for uh, child support um, and those types of purposes. It's kind of a national database that many states have these laws that are um, intended to, to track individuals that are working so they have reportable wages, whether that be as um, W-2 wages or 1099 income um, for purposes of child support. So that's the reason for that. But the, the recent change on the Nebraska side is that they've added the independent contractor um, analysis to that as well. All right, so real quickly, some cl uh, consequences for misclassification. And I've kind of talked about these throughout. Um, but you know, you got liability for um, unpaid federal taxes, workers' compensation premiums, overtime compensation, unemployment insurance. And again, each one of these buckets is going to have a different test that you're looking at to determine how, whether or not the company is going to be liable for those costs. So it can get convoluted. And you know, if you're unfortunate enough to get audited by one of these agencies or have you know, one of these notices provided, I you know, highly recommend that you get somebody involved to help you through the process because you want to make sure that if you're Getting through, even if you're getting through an unemployment audit, you're not making representations and your response to there, that could then be detrimental to you as, as far as workers' comp or federal tax. You wanna make sure you're thinking about all the, all the, the entire picture and make sure that you're covering yourself you know, wherever you can. Um, lessons from litigation, I think these are just some, these are obviously very, very large companies, but just an idea you know, to show you how, how, much, how this liability can impact companies' bottom lines. Um, and obviously, with the names of these companies, this is an issue that impacts you know small worker or small companies all the way up to your you know Fortune 100 companies. Um, it can be a very significant issue. All right. So all that aside, you know how do, how do you approach the issue? You know from your perspective or from your contacts perspective, on setting this up appropriately to make sure that your workers are classified appropriately. Um, first and foremost, you want to make sure that the relationship is properly classified. Um, if you're going to use an independent contractor relationship, you know, you want to make sure that's appropriate. So how do you do that? All those factors that we talked about earlier on the control side, um, how that service that individual is providing or that business is providing relates to your business, how that um, relationship is set up. That's what you want to go through. You want to go through that type of analysis to make sure that the individual you're engaging is appropriately going to be classified as an independent contractor or whether they should actually be an employee. Um, and so it, a lot, that's very, very fact intensive. Um, and you know, talking with any of us, you know, people from Colegest in this room, they can kind of give you the, the high level overview on how that, how that works. Um, but it's gonna be very fact intensive, depends on the type of business you're operating and what you want that individual to do or what you're contracting with them to do. Um, if you had determined that that relationship is appropriate, that you wanna treat them as an independent contractor, you wanna make sure that you have that in writing. 
Um, you know, from an employee perspective, we generally recommend you don't have employment agreements unless they're high level employees or there's something else you're trying to achieve with an employment agreement, maybe some severance, that sort of thing. Otherwise, Nebraska is an at-will state, so we generally recommend you just engage them as at-will employees, maybe a simple offer letter, um, but nothing formal on the employee side. Very, very different for independent contractors, because in independent contractors, you want to be able to have some evidence, you know, in addition to how you're treating the worker, um, of how you're classifying them, and you want the individual sign-on to that as well. So, and I'll talk about here, you know, that paper is not all that important if you're not treating it appropriately, but you want to have that piece of evidence because the default is going to be that they're an at-will employee. So you don't really have to have anything that's going to evidence an at-will employment relationship. But if you're going outside that box, you want to have something to evidence that relationship. So that's why it's important if you're going to be treating them as an independent contractor that you do have something in writing. So in addition to that writing, you definitely want to treat that, in, that worker as an independent contractor, not as an employee throughout the relationship. So you want to be consistent with how you're characterizing that worker and you want to hold that worker out to the public as not the same as your employees, basically. Um, it's going to be very, very damaging to your case if you have an individual you're engaging as an independent contractor providing the exact same services as another individual that you're employing. If they're doing the exact same thing for the company, but sometimes in the exact same times, one treated as a W-2 employee, one treated as a 1099 independent contractor, um, it's going to be very, very challenging to get out of that situation without having that 1099 worker recla reclassified in almost any situation. So you want to make sure that you're treating them appropriately um, throughout the relationship, that what, you're, what, you, what we have in your paper, you know, we can draft you the, the best agreement ever with all the bells and whistles, but if you as a company then treat the worker more as an employee, the, the worker thinks of themselves as, as an employee, all the other facts and circumstances, evidence, employment relationship, despite what we have in the paper, um, you know, the, the paper won't carry the day at the, at the, end, of the, you know, at the end of the argument. All right, so with respect to proper, proper documentation, um, you want a written agreement that fully outlines what's going on, uh, specifically states what the worker is going to be doing, what they're intended to do as an independent contractor, um, addresses control issue. That's going to be the biggest piece of, of our agreement. Um, if many of you may have seen some of the agreements that we've prepared, but there's a big section in there that talks about all these the, the kind of the 20 factors that the IRS looks at or the common law looks at. Really goes through and hits all those to make sure that there's complete, at least on paper, understanding of who's responsible for what, who's paying taxes, who's not. Um, who's responsible for the, the method of the work. You know, all we're carried about if we're an independent contractor is we want the results. We want the lawn mowed. Um, we don't really care if you use a riding mower or a push mower. We want the lawn mowed, um, that type of thing. Um, again, specifies lack of statutory benefits, exclusion from your plans. If you're a company that has a, you know, either a small or a large employee workforce, you want to make it crystal clear in this agreement that that individual engaged as an independent contractor is not eligible for all the benefits that you may be affording your employees. If you provide vacation time, um, if you provide some sort of health insurance, you know, your independent contractors aren't going to be included in those plans and, and those buckets. Um, assign tax liability to the independent contractor, um, disclaiming obligation to withhold. That's important um, uh, for obvious reasons. You want to make sure that you're also indemnifying the company. Um, so if the independent contractor fails to make their own, you know, withholding payments or pay the taxes on their own, the, the agencies can't look through to the company and say, well, they didn't pay, you're responsible for paying. And, uh, you know, mentioning state laws, there's some states that actually require specific language to appear in independent contractor agreements. Again, Nebraska hasn't been as over the top on this as other states, but if you venture outside Nebraska, Colorado is one that requires some very specific language and is nearby. Um, so I just point that out. If you're outside Nebraska, there may be some other considerations to look at. All right, so how do, if you've already got some workers that are structured and you have the situation set up, you know, what do you do or how do you make sure that you have everything set up appropriately? Well, good idea to do kind of a little internal audit. Um, you know, review your current practices and policies. You know, look for those situations where I mentioned before where you have maybe one or two workers or two or more workers that are doing the same things that may not be consistently classified. Because um, again, that's kind of a red flag and an issue where it's going to be pretty challenging to get through any type of audit unscathed. You know, there's going to be some issues there um, if that issue is not addressed. Um, if you do have that issue, you know, analyze this control component. Um, run through those factors, you know, contact someone that can help you work through that uh, process to make sure that you're appropriately classifying everybody, see what's the, what is the appropriate way, and if, you've, if there's something that's incorrect, you know, we can get it fixed at this point and hopefully get you pointed on the right direction. Um, if you do have an independent contractor relationship that's not evidenced by an agreement, 
highly, highly recommend getting a written agreement in place. Again, that's just because you have to be able to prove to the state that your classification as independent contractor is, is appropriate. And anything that you can provide to help make that case is going to be helpful. You want all your facts and circumstances, you know, all your actual relationships lining up, but that paper can help as well. Um, and any other copies of documents that you have proving that, you know, your history of paying and misclassified large sections of the workforce. And what this basically allows for, it's a, it's a safe harbor. So it says if you've consistently classified the segment of your workers for a long period of time, um, and you've kind of reasonably relied on that classification, whether that be through legal counsel, whether that be through some sort of case, industry standard, that sort of thing, um, you can basically assert this as an affirmative defense. If the Internal Revenue Service says you owe us back taxes of X, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars for these workers, this is a way that you can sometimes get away from that um, back liability at least and basically say we've consistently treated these workers. There's an industry, you know, in our industry, it's common standard practice for these workers to be treated in this fashion. We've done that. We've done everything we could to, you know, hold this up as an independent contractor relationship. Even though maybe it's not right now according to your tests, um, we, you know, we shouldn't be penalized for it. So this can be a helpful kind of backdoor to get out of some of these liabilities. Um, the, the one issue with this is that it's, it's just, again, one test. It's the IRS. So this doesn't apply for your state unemployment, your state workers' comp, um, your state taxes. So there's, there's still all those other cuts at the apple um, that, that this won't get to. But a lot of times, you know, it comes up in the context of an IRS audit. You're going to get dinged for this maybe on the first time. So this is a, one way to look at it um, and maybe to provide you some relief. So happen to take any, any questions if you guys have any and kind of work through any other issues. So yeah. Right. So, it, well, it depended. Did he sign the non or did he sign that non compete when he came to work for them initially, or when they converted him to an employee? I think when he came initially, he said they haven't since they took him from from a commission basis to salary. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to kind of look at the agreement to see how that's worded, but it might still apply depending on, and I, if he, when he was, as an independent contractor, was he coming through an agency or did he have his own business that he contracted with the company through the business or did he contract with the company on an individual basis? I believe he had his own business first and then they hired him. Gotcha, okay. He still, he still has another business. Okay. Well, because if the, if the non-compete or this restrictive agreement is just with the, his business and the other business, um, there might be, you know, an argument that it wouldn't apply to him on his individual basis if he was going out later because they were contracting as two companies, not as individual services. Um, depending on how that's drafted, though, when we're, and a lot of times when we're representing companies in that situation, when we put those independent contractor agreements together, um, we'll tie that to the company and principals so that the, and if you have this type of situation, you know, you can't hide behind kind of the corporate shell. 